I'd like to start us off with a land acknowledgement. While we recognize that people are perhaps joining this forum from all over, given that this is being hosted by the New York Metro chapter of PNHP, we think it's important to acknowledge the land on which we are based, the, the occupied and unceded territory of the Wappinger, Muncie, Lenape, Canarsie, and Rockaway peoples. With that recognition must come an unwavering commitment to decolonize and unsettle not only the physical spaces we create and share, but our hearts, minds, and politics as well. <clears throat> an unwavering commitment to critically challenge the conditions we have been socialized to accept, and an unwavering commitment to pursue collective liberation. We need to fight for reparations and invest in systems that are life affirming, to which the work of health justice and equity is intimately linked. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Oliver Fine, who is the chair of the New York Metro chapter of Physicians for National Health Program to begin tonight's program. Take it away, Ali. Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is Dr. Oliver Fine, board chair of the New York Metro chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program. We work to build the movement for universal, single-payer, publicly financed health care for all and health justice. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Tonight, we will be talking about the growing role of private equity and other for-profit investor-controlled health care. Even as more Americans and doctors support national health insurance, this growing financialization across many sectors of health care threatens both quality and cost of care and increases the challenges we face in our united efforts for political and policy change. We hope you will join us for our next educational forum on November 15th, which will focus on Native American health and health care. Further details will be announced by email, so please make sure you are on our email list. You can sign up on the front page of our website at www.phpnymetro.org backslash join. Now, I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight's forum, Judy Esterquest, PhD. Judy, along with Dr. Steve Auerbach and the rest of our planning team, has worked hard to craft tonight's important program. Before her active advocacy for the New York Health Act, she worked over two decades as a management consultant after teaching at Harvard Business School. Judy is also the health issues specialist for the New York State League of Women Voters. This summer, she led a team to update the National League's position healthcare. Dr. Judy, take it away. Thank you, Ollie, and good evening to all of you. Um, tonight, we are delighted to have three eminent speakers uh, Professor Roseberry Batt, Dr. Robert McNamara, and Richard Mallet. I'm looking for some slides. Their years of research, writing, teaching, and advocating will bring sunlight to an otherwise opaque and esoteric subject, that is private equity in healthcare, and its effect on patients, their families, doctors, healthcare workers, and our healthcare system. Although you may be outraged or even terrified by what you learn here tonight, please join our calls for action. You can make a difference. Before we hear from Rose, I'd like to set the stage. Now, many of you have seen this, this, next slide. It's one of PNHP's classics. 
It shows the cost of health care as a percentage of GDP increasing between 1960 and today. And it shows particularly how the cost of American health care has increased at a more rapid rate than Canada's cost. After Canada adopted a single payer system and the US introduced HMOs, which supported and corporatized our health care. In 1973, healthcare costs were 8% of GDP, and politicians warned us that costs might someday hit 10% unless we acted. Note that healthcare cost as a percent of GDP reached 20% this past year. What do we mean by privatizing healthcare? It's introducing market based rewards on the promise of reducing costs, which means these reforms have not, something these reforms have not done. What they have done is deny health care, delay health care, discourage patients from seeking vital health care, and demoralize our health care providers. Next slide. In 1997, we got Medicare Choice as part of a balanced budget compromise. And in 2000, it was rebranded Medicare Advantage when drug plans were introduced. In 2010, the ACA created a mandate for private insurance, a further bonanza for privatization. And most recently, we have DCEs and their rebranding as ACOH. And today we're talking about private equity, once called LBO, leveraged buyouts. I've been asked to explain that private equity, meaning private ownership, as in owning shares in a company, refers to ownership that is not traded on public stock exchanges. When companies' shares are traded publicly, it's regulated by the SEC which among other things requires transparency, for example, through regular filings of financial statements. If shares are traded privately, there are few regulations and even less transparency. Our first speaker has spent years in research to shine light on this opacity. Her research shows that private equity controls 4.5 trillion in funding globally, and that 80% of the largest private equity firms and transactions are Americans. They have targeted healthcare for two decades, investing 4.8 billion in 2000 and 105 billion in, in 2020. Now let's make this a tiny bit more tangible. In the past two decades, private equity firms have bought, sold and dismantled all of these famous American companies some with storied past dating back a century or more. These businesses are now history, even if sometimes their brands live on. I wanna thank Morgan Moore for these riveting shark and octopus graphics, well done. Last year, Eileen Applebaum, who is Rose Bat's long-term research partner, testified at a hearing on Senator Warren's Stop Wall Street saying, the rising tide of capital flowing into PE funds has left them sitting on piles of dry powder. They are now in a better position than ever to buy up and hollow out large parts of the US and global economies. But what do huge private equity investments mean for healthcare? Next slide. Private equity has bought and controlled an astonishing range of healthcare services. Healthcare is a lucrative target for private equity, and Professor Bat and Applebaum's estimates over the past of the past two years that, that estimate that two years ago the dry powder available to private equity firms to aim at U.S. businesses was between 1.5 and 2 trillion dollars. That's 10 percent of the U.S. economy. This will be what Professor Bat will discuss. Rosemary Batt is the Alice Hansen Professor of Women and Work at the Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations. She is co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research with Eileen Applebaum, her research collaborator for over a decade about the increasing role of private equity in healthcare and in other sectors of our economy. She has a book on the subject pending. She received her BA from Cornell University and her PhD from the Sloan School of Management, MIT. Welcome, Professor Bat. The floor is yours. There we are. Thank you so much, Judy, and thank you to Steve and Mandy and, and Morgan for all of the work you've done in putting this together. 
And I'm going to jump right into my presentation because we have a lot to cover. And I'm also going to time myself so that there's plenty of room for other people as well. So let me start uh, private equity in healthcare. Um, it, I've done all of this work um, with Eileen uh, Applebaum, as Judy mentioned, and we've been working on this for 10 years. So I'm bringing together evidence-based um, research that shows exactly what um, private equity uh, has done over the last um, uh, several years. Let me jump in and first begin by saying we view private equity as the most extreme form of shareholder capitalism. And what we mean by that is that the mentality of um, corporations as only meeting the needs of their shareholders through uh, maximizing profits is one that has taken hold across the United States and now is moving into healthcare as well. And so we view private equity as a more extreme form than a for-profit corporation, and I'll outline why that's true. Private equity creates a private investment fund and promises its investors outside uh, outsized returns. And to provide those outside returns, it buys up healthcare providers, such as hospitals, to extract wealth, not to provide healthcare services. And how does it do this? It extracts, um, it cuts staffing, supplies services, reduces service access, sells assets, uses monopoly power to charge higher rents. And it has penetrated virtually every aspect of healthcare, as Judy mentioned, and it is com almost completely unregulated. So it goes beneath the radar of uh, regulators and the public. Um, now, what does it do to really change healthcare? I argue that it turns healthcare from a social good into a financial asset. So these are Wall Street financiers who view companies as pure financial assets or almost Lego chips to be bought and sold. And the visual that I have that I think reflects this is you can think of this as a hospital beforehand, before private equity, and this afterwards. So they pull apart organizations and pull off or buy the most uh, lucrative parts, or they buy the whole hospital and then get rid of the less uh, profitable parts in order to piece together those pieces that are the most profitable for them. So it extracts wealth through financial strategies, not by providing health services. Uh, now, let me go and give a, an example before I go into the model. You can see a visual here before and afterwards. And my point was that private equity pulls apart organizations and pulls out the most financially lucrative parts, maybe sells off the rest so that it can make the most profits. And it uh, extracts mainly through financial strategies, not by providing healthcare. Okay, here's an example to show you what I mean. Uh, this is in nursing homes. It's a major study done recently. And the authors found that when private equity took over the nursing homes in, in across the state uh, through several years of New Jersey, mortality rates in PE owned homes were 10% higher than the overall average but Medicare billing was also 11% higher and frontline nurses spend fewer hours with patients uh, in order to cut costs from, by the private equity firm. And the homes made 50% more use of anti-psychotic drugs. So that's an example of where private equity is trying to squeeze profits out of the nursing home. And the results are that patients suffer uh, and, and Medicare bills go up at the same time. Okay, so let me now go into the, the business model of private equity. Um, and this is a little bit uh, complicated, but I'm gonna walk you through it. So don't be intimidated by this slide. Uh, we can start with the private equity firm, uh, which is um, owned by general partners. They create a private equity fund and they get their money from investors that are mainly pension funds, in institutional investors, or wealthy individuals. That is 98% of the fund. 
and the private equity firm, they only put in one or 2% of the money. So they are basically playing with other people's money. Then they require these partners, limited partners, to keep the money in for 10 years. And they require a 2% annual fee from those investors. And that money, so for example, the average uh, private equity fund is now $1 billion. And so that means that 200 million, 2% 2, 2 annually times 10, goes off the top directly into the pockets of the private equity firm and they can do whatever they want with that money. And it is, there is no accountability. They, they do not expense the money. This is purely gravy for the private equity firm. The rest of the money they invest in portfolio companies, they buy hospitals, they buy nursing homes, et cetera. And they use only 30% equity, which means their own money, their equity ownership. And they then borrow an additional 70% from banks or creditors so that they are investing only 30% in buying out a, a company. Then when the um, after five years, they try to flip the company. And at that point, they get 20% of the profits. So here you have they're only investing 2% in the fund, but they're getting 20% of the profits. So the, the investors are actually getting considerably less, disproportionately less than the private equity partners themselves. Now, they do this several times over because they have uh, a fund, they're using a lot of debt so they can spread their own money over buying several companies and they can set up another private equity fund. So here's another one. So KKR, for example, now owns over a hundred companies at once. And so if any one of those companies happens to go bankrupt, they don't really care because they, they don't, uh, they have many other companies and the debt that they have put on the company is on the portfolio company. It is not on the private equity firm. So it's like having a mortgage, but having someone else responsible for paying your home mortgage and you're not held responsible. Um, and so this ends up being bad for the companies and bad for the stakeholders but the private equity firms make a lot of money in this process. So let me go further. Here is a, a strategy where they start with a high level of debt and now they have to figure out how to make money, how to make outsized returns. So one way they can do it is operational. That's what all hospitals do. They cut, they cut costs that they need to, they um, and try to get higher revenues. So that's pretty typical, but private equity tends to do this on steroids. In addition, they have what we call financial engineering strategies that um, I'll explain in a minute. And then the outcomes are they are managing for cash flow. They want to increase the flow of cash in order to service the debt that they have put on the company, but also to extract cash for the, the investors. And then the jobs and sustainability of the company are uh, to be seen. Now, what are financial engineering strategies? The first, as I've said, is excessive use of debt uh, that is loaded on the provider. And that means that there increases the risk of ban bankruptcy or poor financial performance. Then there's also uh, that forces cost cutting in order to service the debt, as I've just mentioned. A second way that there is financial engineering is charging portfolio company fees. In other words, I'm going to charge the company for advisory services that I'm providing, and I'm the one who is in charge of the company to begin with, so I can kind of double dip, if you will. Third, uh, dividend recapitalizations. Now, that's a very fancy word for simply meaning taking more debt more loans out and loading it on the provider, loading it on the portfolio company. And when I do that, rather than using that money maybe to make improvements in the hospital, 
I use it to pay myself a dividend. And so I'm going to take money, extract money essentially from the provider and pay myself a dividend. And these, these loans are considered junk bond status, which essentially means they have to pay very, very high interest rates, again, loaded on the portfolio company or on the healthcare provider. Then there is another way of doing of sucking money out of portfolio companies, and it's called a sale leaseback. Here is where the, the private equity firm sells the property underneath a medical provider and uses that money, again, to pay itself a dividend. So it doesn't use that money maybe to, again, improve technology or improve services. It uses it for its own uh, personal gain. The providers, the healthcare, the hospitals, for example, are saddled with long-term debt, inflated rents with escalators on property they once owned. Okay, and then finally, monopoly power. They uh, target markets with potential market mo monopoly power. They buy more providers and create a chain. So for example, I uh, buy up physician practices and then I buy up some more and I, I load them into one corporation and they're all in a local or region, a regional area so that I can control the market and extract higher rents in that way. Um, the buyouts in healthcare tend to be so small, like 100 million, which is a lot of money, but a small enterprise, that they go below the radar of the antitrust monitoring of the federal government because they only monitor um, buyouts if they're like 200 million or more. Um, and private equity is responsible for 45% of the mergers and acquisitions in healthcare, even though they're very, very small players. Okay, now, how do private equity owned companies differ from for, for profits? This is important. I've already mentioned capital structure. And so here, private equity uses 70% debt, but for profit corporations, maybe only 30%. So the for-profit corporations are not as financially vulnerable. Then the regulatory oversight, the transparency, the accountability are all little to none under private equity. And that's because they are almost not accountable at all to the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. Whereas for-profit co corporations have to uh, submit very substantial uh, reports to the uh, SEC. And finally, risk-taking, as I said, is very high under private equity, not so much under for-profit corporations. Then, in addition, there are asset sales, which I just mentioned, that uh, are very, very frequent under private equity ownership, but not, but quite rare under for-profits because they want to hold on to their, their organizations and they're not going to sell them. The debt used for dividends is very frequent in private equity, not so in for-profits. The fees paid by the um, enterprise are large. There are no fees charged by for-profit corporations. The taxes under private equity are a low capital gains rate as opposed to corporate income tax. And then the reputational risks are low. When people see a hospital that is poorly run, they make the attribution to the hospital, but it may very well be run, as in the steward case I'm about to show you, by a private equity firm who's hiding behind the name of the hospital. So we never see who is really owning the hospital and the, the kind of shenanigans they're pulling behind the scenes. Okay, here I'm gonna give you a few cases to illustrate what I just said. First of all, Sequel Youth um, and Family Services. They provide residential treatment centers, autism, mental health programs, and operate in 15 states, 40 facilities. This is private equity buying and horse trading. In 2010, they were bought out by a private equity firm called Levin Lechman. 2013, that private equity firm sold it to another one called Alaris. 
2016, Alaris does a dividend recapitalization. That's where they load a lot of debt on the Sequel Youth Services, and they take out a dividend for themselves. And then 2017, they go ahead and sell it to another private equity firm. They've made their money. Now they're going to roll it over to another private equity firm. So how does it make money? Well, it's 100% funded with taxpayer dollars by Medicaid and Medicare that charge very high rates per, per day per child. And this is a quote from the owner. He says, we get paid on time and it's government money and there's plenty of it. And that's what makes this an ideal business to invest in. So we're doing this all on the backs of taxpayers. Um, I'll go on a little further. Um, what's the impact on healthcare staff? They hire unqualified, low cost labor, no background checks, low staff patient ratios. And here's again, the owner saying, you can make a lot of money in this business if you just control staffing. They willfully have failed to report patient abuses to the authorities. Um, and then the impact on children is absolutely horrible. This is a case that has been in the news. It's been well researched by no a number of organizations. Patients' rights groups and state investigators found widespread abuse in 18 states. The foster children moved to out-of-state locations around the country. Verbal, mental, and sexual abuse improper restraints, rampant violence, and in one death, uh, a tragic uh, story um, where a, a Connor was horrifically brutalized sexually, physically, and emotionally by other residents because there wasn't supervision. So this is a really horrific example of what private equity can get away with. Um, and there are suits now going after them but uh, it, it doesn't matter because Sequel, um, while their contracts have been canceled, they just move on. They move on to other states and they're still in operation big time. Okay, hospitals. Here's an example of Steward. And we find that um, the, in 2011, a private equity firm named Cerberus bought six hospitals in um, Massachusetts, Catholic hospitals. And they were required by the Massachusetts Attorney General to hold on to them for five year, years and do charity care and invest because they were nonprofits being converted to for profit status. Once they did that for five years, then the Massachusetts uh, AG stopped monitoring and what happened? Well, in 2016, they did one of these sale leasebacks. So they, they sold all of the property for $1.25 billion from under the hospitals. And then Cerberus paid itself 500 million off the top in dividends. Then it went on, um, the hospitals were saddled with long-term leases on property they used to own and their leases increased at 3% a year. This is hospitals that had owned their places since the 1800s, and now we're paying inflated rent in Boston. Um, 2016 through 19, Stewart went on a national buying spree and got 33 hospitals in, in total through horse trading so they could get bigger and bigger for their monopoly power. And in 2019, Stewart was found to be the worst performing system in Massachusetts highest debt, higher than average patient falls, infections, patient readmissions, investigations found vendors were not paid, understaffing, et cetera. So that's Steward. And finally, it exited by selling the whole system to a group of doctors, and it made pure profit of $700 million. Now, I'm gonna give you just a couple more examples and close. Here is Prospect Medical. Now, it focused on safety net hospitals. So in between these eight years, it bought 20 safety net hospitals. It used extensive debt, cut costs, cut labor, stripped real, real estate, just like Steward. It collected 658 million in dividends and fees, despite telling the regulators in the state it was not going to do that. 
and it received over 300 million in CARES uh, relief in 2021. Uh, the Rhode Island AG has set conditions for its conversion, but that is still pending. And the Senate oversight hearing delved deeply into prospect and um, that is still pending. Okay, now I wanna move to a couple more points. Um, surprise medical billing, maybe you've heard of that. It's where um, patients find that they go to an emergency room and they get stuck with a very large bill that they didn't expect because they thought their insurance would cover it. And this has emerged because um, hospitals have needed to outsource or say they need to outsource their emergency rooms because of the costs. So this has become a trend across the United States. But what many people don't know is that the leading emergency room staffing companies are owned by private equity. So 40%, there are two companies, Envision and Team Health, and, and Dr. McNamara will talk about them, employ 90,000 healthcare employees, control 40% of the market, and they are the leaders in supplies medical billing, charging thousands uh, to patients that, that didn't expect it. Uh, in 2020, they spent millions to try to prevent legislation that would ban uh, surprise billing. And in 2021, doctors, the California doctors filed suit, and this is what Dr. Um, McNamara is going to talk about. Okay, uh, the same for emergency air ambulances. There are two private equity-owned carriers that control 65% of the market. Uh, they had average charges per ride of $48,000, far more than any other competitor. They are not covered by the ban on surprise medical bills, and they particularly affect, of course, rural towns where hospitals have closed. So let me just show you, this is the uh, graph that Judy was referring to about the rise in private equity funding. It has risen 25 fold in uh, just 20 years. And so it is a very serious actor in the healthcare space that we need to be very concerned about. Uh, and so finally wrapping up, uh, it, in, it uh, is interested in market uh, opportunities because uh, the market is fragmented and market demand is rising. And there are niches like outpatient and behavioral health that uh, they're very interested in. And on the supply side, there are hospitals that have these financial pressures. So in conclusion, private equity shifts the primary goal from serving patients to extracting wealth for outsized returns. Leverage debt, property sell-off, dividend recapitalizations undermine financial stability. Targets are hospitals, nursing homes, patients. And finally, most importantly, hot markets are mental health hospice and home care where many people are dying um, and they uh, have and they extract wealth at taxpayers expense and we'll talk about this later I'll just put up these uh, general points these are examples of how we could regulate private equity so by increasing transparency limiting leverage discouraging these financial tricks closing tax loopholes, holding private equity firms accountable as employers, and updating the employment bankruptcy and pension laws, as well as then healthcare specific legislation. So I'm going to stop and turn it back over to my friends. And I'm very sorry for the uh, slow start that we got. That's perfectly well. Thank you, Rose. I have to tell you completely riveting albeit frightful. The uh, chat is filled with questions and hair exploding. Uh, we're now going to hear from Dr. Robert McNamara about how, how all this affects physicians and why we must take medicine back. Uh, Robert McNamara is a leader of Take Medicine Back, which advocates, which advocates to remove corporate interests from medicine interests that exploit patients and physicians alike. He currently serves as the chairman of the Emergency Medical Medicine 
uh, at Temple University Hospital, and he's a founding member and past president of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine, <laughs> which seeks to preserve physician-owned practices in emergency medicine, and which has honored him with its Master of American Academy of Emergency Medicine Award. So take it away, Robert. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm also a Phillies fan, so I'm missing the game for this. I'll catch it later, I'm saving it. All right, so um, you heard my background. Uh, roll to the next slide. So why is an emergency physician speaking? Well, you just heard some stuff from uh, the prior speaker. Uh, EM is uh, unfortunately the specialty that opened the door to private equity. And as with a lot of things, we were our own worst enemy. Uh, So-called leaders of specialty actually helped us along, but we're also leading the fight against it through what we just heard a couple of different organizations and the litigation. Next. All right, so briefly, looking at the EM angle for Envision, which was just mentioned, this started out as a company called MCARE. Uh, it was founded by the 1980 president of one of our professional societies. So that's a lay law in 96, moving emergency medicine into lay ownership. And then later it turned over to PE when lay law sold to Onyx in 2004. There was a merger with AMSUR, Ambulatory Surgery Centers in 2017. And the most recent acquisition you can look at the number here, 9.9 .9 billion for KKNR taking it over in 2018. Next. So our specialty uh, doesn't look that good. Um, these large companies, uh, in addition to Team Health and Envision, there's called the Schumacher Group. They're completely controlled by private equity and there's a major stake in a lot of other large staffing companies. And we tend, we're told, and I tend to believe, that if P is investing in you, they have control. Uh, they're not gonna put their money somewhere that they, they can't really control it. So estimates over 40, sometimes people say 50% of the EDs in the country are controlled by corporate groups with ties to private equity. Next. So again, we just heard this um, short-term high profit for investors. This conflicts with doctors, you know, we swear the oath to, to put the patients first. And the core methods that we just heard about can cause patient harm. They want to maximize revenue, minimize expenses. Next. Okay, so on the revenue side, it's clear, and this is there's a lot of evidence out there when PE comes in, takes over a, a physician owned practice, that the charges go way up. They go from a typical physician charging, you know, rates of three to four times in Medicare to to eight to nine times the Medicare rate. So they set high charges. They pursue the patients for these high charges. Team Health was caught suing the poor in uh, Tennessee. That was the, you know, published in NPR. And then they pressure the, the caregivers. How many patients per hour are you seeing? Are you ordering tests to help inflate the, uh, the charges, the, the level of service, you know, making us adhere to metrics, making sure we put everything on the chart possible to generate the most money. The surprise billing crisis that came about, emergency medicine had a huge hand in that. I won't go further, but the, the research clearly showed that this was a business strategy for these PE-backed firms. Next. All right, so the expense side is really, that has a great deal of concern among physicians. Um, minimizing staffing, we just saw this happen in nursing homes while it's happening in your local emergency department. You know, they want to have the maximal patients per hour seen by those giving the care. And then also to cut expenses, what's the most expensive equation of emergency medicine? It's the paying a board certified emergency physician. Um, and we know that they'll replace doctors with non-physicians. They'll eliminate costly senior physicians, the most experienced doctors, because, well, they've been getting the pay raise every year. And they'll use non-emergency medicine specialists. And then creating unstaffed arrangements where you have a doctor on, but they're required to quote unquote supervise non physician providers, PAs, NPs, four or five at a time. And they really can't do that. We call that notional supervision. Next. So, I mean, this is an example. Here's an Envision ad uh, put out to hospitals contact us. 
uh, we're going to hire APPs, you know, PAs and NPs. They cost two thirds of what a doctor does. Next. This is a slideshow from an envisioned physician uh, that we're able to get a hold of. Again, how to staff your emergency department. Use the least expensive resource to accomplish the mission. Non-specialists, family practitioners, internists. They go on down to the last bullet to say that if you're going to use residents, just use ones that you can exploit those that are further along in their training where you don't have to teach them as much and they can see a lot of patients. So this obviously, you know, has physicians disgruntled uh, with these companies. Next. Now, more importantly, you know, for the patients, um, you count on your doctor to be your advocate. And it is fairly clear that in this situation, in emergency medicine physicians cannot speak on behalf of the patient because their contracts say we can terminate you at any time with no reason given. Uh, you will give up your any rights you had under the medical staff, the Joint Commission requirement to have what's called due process. Uh, I published a paper on this where we asked physicians, this was actually uh, prompted by CMS who were trying to get to change the code of federal re regulations to not allow third party denial to due process. Hasn't happened yet, but we saw that corporate groups versus other arrangements, hospital employed, this was much more likely to happen. Uh, and hospital administrators, you know, they have the power to, you know, fire that doctor who's complaining about inadequate nursing staff, um, you know, too much boarding in the emergency department. And we saw, unfortunately, that EM heroes were fired during the pandemic for advocating for patient safety, um, for safety of the staff, safety of themselves, their families, and certainly the patients with protective equipment. A couple of high profile cases. Next slide. Right, and if you want to see something further that'll really disturb you, this is an emergency medicine-based story that Steve Croft did in 2013 on 60 Minutes called The Cost of Admission. HMA, now defunct, colluded with Envision to coerce emergency physicians to admit to a quote. If an elderly patient came in, we expect 50% of them to be admitted. Otherwise, you could lose your job, or you will lose your job if you don't enforce this the directors were pressured. This is a classic example of profits over patients. It is a danger to obviously admit a patient to the hospital who doesn't need to be admitted. Um, hospital acquired infections, just stress, you can't get sleep in the hospital. Um, a lot of complications can happen. Uh, next. All right, and you know, if you look at the burnout rate in emergency medicine, uh, we're number one. And we have a high infiltration of, of private equity. And I got involved in this as an educator. I, uh, we train residents here. We take medical students and teach them emergency medicine and hopefully to go out and serve the public. It's a difficult specialty. We're there 24 seven. We work nights, weekends, holidays. We see things that you, you, you couldn't imagine. We see young people die. Here at Temple, we see high rates of penetrating trauma, violent death, the forefront of the opioid crisis. Um, it's extremely difficult to, to take care of patients in emergency medicine. And if you feel you're being taken advantage of, that some private equity company is, is taking money out of your pockets, it's just, you're not going to survive. And this is a, a big contributor to physician burnout. And then along the way, you know, before that doctor decides you're going to leave, they're not at their best, right? They're not taking care of the patients the best because they're Disillusioned, they're angry, they're not thinking clearly. And of course, from our perspective as physicians, that burned out doctor doesn't like going to work, is angry when he comes home from work, it affects them, their family. Physician suicide rates are high. Uh, we've seen a couple of EM docs during the pandemic take their lives, all very concerning to us. Next. So we're fighting back. And uh, this was mentioned by Rosemary, you know, there are in most states, some prohibition on the corporate practice of medicine, which essentially states businesses can't employ physicians because it puts that financial interest between the doctor and their patient. Lawyers have the same thing. They have the, the, the legal prohibition on lay interest owning them. Um, so we currently have a suit in California where strong prohibitions exist. The way all of these private equity companies get around it in emergency medicine 
is they get a friendly captive doctor, what we call the paper owner, to own the contract. And these are really just, we hope we're going to be able to pierce this in our litigation. Uh, we have already in a court ruling in this case where Dr. Ray Brovant, who sued Envision for wrongful termination, about speaking up about poor staffing, uh, there was one Envision doctor who testified that he owned 275 to 300 professional corporations in over 20 states on behalf of Envision. That's a sham. We hope to break that down. Next. And then, you know, other things going on, right? Investigative reporters, you heard some of this stuff going on, shining the light, bringing it out to the public, forums like this that we're having tonight. Uh, the FTC DOJ just announced an investigation of a very similar group in anesthesia, U.S. anesthesia partners that has private equity investment. Um, we're trying to pressure state attorney generals and boards of medicine who theoretically are supposed to be enforcing these corporate practice laws. Legislative efforts will be key. Uh, we just saw uh, <clears throat> Representative Pasquale from Jersey basically call for oversight of the HCA and Vision Joint Venture. So we, you know, we had the HMA 60 Minutes show. We think the same kind of pressures are going on with HCA and the Vision in terms of admitting patients uh, at a hospital for more, <clears throat> more lucrative arrangements for HCA. Next. So basically, uh, this is how what we believe at Take Medicine Back and the American Academy, that private equity cannot be an accepted part of medicine. Their goals conflict with our oath to the patients. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Robert. That's that, that's an amazing story. It's exciting to hear how you're fighting back, and we, I'm sure, many of us want to join your your campaign. Um, the next, the next speaker is Richard Mollett, who will talk about long term care, how nursing private equity in nursing homes affect patients and their families. He is a lawyer. He is the executive director of the Long-Term Care Community Coalition, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that's dedicated to improving care for individuals in nursing homes and other residential care settings. He, they do this through legal and policy research, advocacy, and education. Richard has researched and published on a variety of long-term care issues, including dementia care, nursing home and assisted living standards, and nursing home finances. Richard, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks very much, Judy. And thanks, Steve, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about, my talk is going to focus, excuse me, on nursing homes. But I think a lot of the themes that I heard from Robert and from Rose, um, they, 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 you know, Steve, been through nursing homes, and I think uh, conversely, a lot of what I talk about today, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into a specific uh, sector, will um, resonate for people who are working in hospitals, hospice, et cetera, other places where private equity and private enterprise are, um, are investing. So um, I'm not going to talk about the organization. We already did that. Our website is nursinghome411.org. So some of the things I talk about, all of our work is available on the website for free. What I will talk about is I'm going to give a little bit of a background about the nursing home system, how it works or doesn't work, and then some um, insights into nursing home financing and accountability, as well as some of our recommendations for improving the financial and quality accountability of nursing homes. And then last, I'll just leave off with some of the resources that we have on our website related to nursing homes. Uh, so importantly, and I think this really uh, gets to a lot of what we, you know, we think about in healthcare and uh, also why healthcare and especially nursing homes are so prone to this kind of investment is, um, your nursing home residents are of course, as you can imagine, very vulnerable. They depend upon the nursing home for all of their care, all of their quality of life services. And we actually have really strong laws and standards to protect nursing home residents and to ensure that they get good care in our nation's nursing home. Uh, the nursing home reform law passed in 1987. Every single nursing home in this country that participates, in other words, takes any amount of money from either Medicare or Medicaid agrees to meet or exceed all of the standards in the reform law and in its regulations. And importantly, 
participation in Medicare and Medicaid is entirely voluntary. So if a nursing home doesn't want to participate in Medicare or Medicaid, it can run a private facility. And there are a few of those, I think there are two in New York and there are a few here and there around the country, not very many. Why? Because as Rose and Robert were saying, there's, there's big money and steady money in government funding. So that's what people want. That's what, what investors have long realized and operators have long realized. But again, as I'll talk about, the industry has gotten much more sophisticated. Uh, but importantly, just a few more things about the reform law. Um, to my mind, it's a really special law because I, as I note in the first bullet here, it requires that every resident receives the care and services that they need to attain and maintain their highest practicable physical, emotional, and psychosocial well-being. So unlike other types of industries, I think about car manufacturing or uh, look at my desk, uh, desk manufacturing, uh, uh, regulations tend to focus on the output of what's, what an industry is providing. The nursing home rules and requirements focus on providing care for an individual, um, providing an assessment for them on a regular basis, making a care plan around that assessment. And there are a lot of rules and regulations to ensure that the nursing home is really taking that those responsibilities uh, seriously and performing them, recognizing again, as I mentioned earlier, that residents are so vulnerable. It's not like someone who goes into a restaurant and you know you have a crappy meal, you don't feel too good afterwards. You can you know, write something up online, or you can um, you know you can call and complain, or and you can never go back to that restaurant. Nursing home residents are pretty much stuck. So these rules are really important. So the question is, and I actually use this slide when I speak to families and to uh, advocates as well, is if the laws and standards are so strong, why aren't nursing homes decent places to live and to work? And the reason for that is because laws and standards can only make a difference if they are enforced. And I wanted to include that here because it's really important to why nursing homes have been so attractive to private equity and, and other types of, of investment of vehicles. So the problem is, is that the laws are largely unenforced. We have really poor oversight in this country on both the state and the federal level. And there have been numerous studies, numerous reports you can see here from Forbes to our own study to numerous government accountability and Office of Inspector General reports and audits over the years. So this is a quote from the New York Times, long-term care continues to be understaffed, poorly regulated and vulnerable to predation by for-profit conglomerates and private equity firms. I thought that was interesting. So why is that? And then just a little bit of background on how we've moved in this direction. So uh, before I started, and I've been here uh, with the coalition for it'll be 20 years next month, but early on prior to my time, most nursing homes were what we call mom and pop operations. They were single owner, oftentimes families, oftentimes they would be handed over from generation to generation in a family. And we moved on that, especially after, and I don't want to give, we don't have time to give a tutorial on Medicare and Medicaid funding, but as those funding streams became available, again, the dollar signs and the steadiness of government funds, corporations, limited liability companies went in. Uh, part of that was to seek profits. Part of that was also uh, to hide accountability for when nursing homes would be sued because they substandard care was so poor that the resident really suffered and died. If you hide behind an LLC, by definition, of course, limited liability company, you are hiding, you, you are putting distance between yourself and the operations. Then we saw real estate investment trusts come in. That was around the time that I started. And now more, I would say over the past 10 years, private equity and very sophisticated private investment. So what I want to talk about now in the next couple of slides is really what I've hinted at before is that in the absence of meaningful enforcement, nursing home operators can largely provide any level of staffing and any quality of care and quality of life services that they choose. As Robert mentioned before in one of the slides that focused on or directed the uh, operators to focus on less, um, less experienced staff, less uh, professional staff, this is what we see in nursing homes over and over and over again. Cutting of staff and especially cutting up professional staff such as RNs and very little involvement and I would say decreasing involvement of medical directors. I'm gonna give one quick example of this is staffing. Staffing is the most important corollary 
for quality of care. It's also the most expensive component of, of the cash centers related to cost. Uh, the typical resident needs a little over four hours of nursing care staff time per day just to meet their clinical needs. In fact, the average nursing home in this country provides about 3.62 hours. So substantially below just what's needed to provide decent clinical care. Although short staffing is pervasive, it's rarely cited by either the states or the federal government. And even when it is cited, it's almost never identified as causing harm to residents or putting them in immediate jeopardy of harm. And that's important because unless harm is identified or immediate jeopardy is identified by the inspector, the surveyor, there's virtually no chance of any financial penalty. Conversely speaking is that you can provide low staffing with impunity, thereby saving a lot of money in your operations and reaping a lot of money uh, outside of it. So we did a study on this, I'm not gonna go into it here, but we looked you know, at three years of federal and state data on citations. And so everything we do with the organization, as I mentioned at the start, is really backed up in, uh, with data from the federal government with data that's reported by facilities and of course predicated on the law and the rules. Uh, I thought it was important to get at a couple of things. One uh, regarding financing, before I move on, the last things I'll talk about is some of our recommendations and resources. But the nursing home industry has two very large lobby associations on the national level. Both of them, if you look up their 1099s, are sitting on around $30 million each in assets. Um, most of the states, including states like New York and California, Florida and Texas, which have very big um, sectors, also have very active lobby associations. They perpetuate this myth that nursing homes um, don't make enough money. And in fact, there's nothing independent to substantiate that. And as you saw from Rose's presentation, as well as Robert's, the, but especially I, would, I think in Rose's um, a presentation, there is a lot of ways in which money and assets could be shuffled around. So I'm gonna just skip ahead um, here. We've looked at Medicaid funding as well as Medicare funding. Again, the two primary streams uh, by which nursing homes get public dollars. Uh, Medicaid funding, as you can see from this graph here, has gone up steadily over the years. And Medicare funding, which pays for Medicaid, as, as most of you probably know, pays for most long-term care in this country. Medicare pays for most rehab services. Uh, according to the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, MedPAC, which is a nonpartisan um, a commission that advises Congress, the marginal profit rate for Medicare nursing home patients 2020 was 16.5%. And the average Medicaid profit margin, excuse me, Medicare profit margin has been in the double digits for over 20 years. And year after year, MedPAC advises Congress to cut those rates and year after year, Congress refuses again because the lobby associations are so powerful. Important, as I know here on the side, these profit margins don't take in, into account profits hidden in administrative costs or related party transactions, which is a huge issue, especially in this sector. Um, about 75% of nursing homes use related party transactions to further hide profits. Uh, I thought this was really important to mention. So, and this was one of the most shocking um, studies or reports that I've read in my career is um, Medicare, as I noted on the previous slide, uh, is as the facilities themselves report, double digit profits for 20 years now. And then, as I mentioned a couple of slides before that, the nursing home sector argues over and over again to our legislators, both the state and federal level, that they just, and to the public, including to families and residents, they just don't get enough money to hire more staff. They just don't get enough money to provide better care or better services. And what the OIG did was the Office of Inspector General for HHS, they looked at Medicare beneficiaries. These are the, again, the residents for whom the nursing home is making double digit profits and consistently makes double digit profits by its own reckoning and its own pub published book bookkeeping. And what OIG found was that one third of residents who go into a nursing home for rehab are harmed within an average of two weeks, 15.5 days to be precise. Almost 60%, 59 to be exact, of the injuries were preventable and attributable to poor care. In other words, 
even when they get a ton of money by their own calculation, they still fail our residents and in a shockingly quick manner. If I remember correctly, 6% of those residents who are harmed died and more than half were rehospitalized. Again, costly to the system, costly to taxpayers, but not costly to the nursing homes. So I'm gonna just uh, quickly go over a few of our recommendations. Um, I have three slides here. One is focused on ownership transparency and accountability. And we are advocating for increased ownership reporting for private companies, including parent companies, the property. Because as I think Rose, Rose said in her presentation, a lot of times what, what nursing homes will do is they'll buy, a company will come in, private equity uh, will come in and they will buy a nursing home and then they'll sell the underlying property. It's one great example that was the, um, I can't remember the, the private equity group, David Rubenstein's group. I just um, don't remember the name offhand about 15 or so years ago now that did exactly that with one of the major nursing home uh, chains in this country and essentially drove it out of business. But they come in, you know, so we wanna make sure that anyone who is related to the nursing home operations is, um, uh, is, has a responsibility in terms of both transparency, financial transparency, as well as financial accountability. Uh, we also have recommendations regarding quality uh, and how that quality gets to financing. Here is um, two sets of recommendations. One is there should be a direct care spending requirement, meaning that the nursing home should have to provide, a, should have to, excuse me, use a certain amount, certain percentage of the money they receive for care actually on care. Uh, and the second part of that is to specifically limit administrative costs as well as profits. As I note here, New York actually was one of the more, I wouldn't say ambitious, um, because New Jersey, as you can see here, Massachusetts, other states have done a little bit better in terms of percentage of, re, of uh, spending requirements, but New York was a little bit more comprehensive in respect of both having a 70% spending requirement, meaning you have to spend 70% of your reimbursement on resident care, 40% of it on staffing, and limiting profits to 5%. The nursing home industry, by the way, it has two lawsuits, one in federal court and one in state court to prevent those rules from going into place. And our last set of recommendations is regarding quality and accountability. And some of these are recommended, actually all these recommendations here, as well as some of the recommendations I spoke about further are reflected in President Biden's proposal, which he announced in the State of the Union speech last February to essentially reform nursing home care. Well, we've long called for establishing meaningful quantitative nursing home staffing standards and the president did in fact specifically call for that and then also ensuring that the minimum standards are met uh, as i started off with my presentation talking about that although the rules are good they're just not enforced and therefore they're not meaningful so we need to have enforcement and i'm just going to lastly um oh maybe sorry i have a slide about my conclusions so um just in in short the federal data, numerous studies, both our own studies as well as the OIG, GAO, et cetera, have found that the nursing home industry is increasingly run by for-profit entities and that these operators have become increasingly sophisticated in regard to both moving from, into REITs and private equity, other sophisticated private investment, but also funneling money out through ever more sophisticated means of related party transactions, which as I know we were talking in the uh, chat before, are extremely hard to find, even with supposedly better uh, better, um, better information provided by CMS on the web. Uh, importantly, in regard to the industry arguments about their, you know, in defense of their longstanding problems, poor staffing, poor infection control, poor conditions, is that one, their argument that there's not enough money is completely unsubstantiated. And second, it's irrelevant. As I said at the start, nursing homes voluntarily agree to participate in Medicare and Medicaid. It's not a warehouse. It's not a factory farm. It's someplace where you are providing care to residents. Uh, and I'm just gonna leave very quickly with some of our resources. This is our website. We have data which we publish on every single nursing home in the country. It is self-reported, but under the Affordable Care Act, it's required to be audited or auditable at least. So we have some good information about nursing home quality as well as tools and resources for residents. And thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Richard. Uh, some extraordinary findings you've outlined for something that most of us only know about from having a loved one 
rather than actually knowing about it. Um, before we move to Q&A, we're going to ask uh, Steve Auerbach if he would do some calls to action, because it sure looks like a lot of you want something done about this. Go for it, Steve. Steve, are you muted? And Steve needs to be spotlighted. Sorry, next slide. So um, we've heard how bad it is. And I just want to point out that even, even some senior members at the AMA, um, our good friends at the AMA agree, uh, pointing out that uh, private equity firms uh, buy practices and their investors are expecting uh, their money back in a short term, uh, he says five to seven, in some cases more like three to five years at 20 to 30% profit. And that's just not a situation. Uh, which can ever lead to an expectation of long-term relationships. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite, uh, to say nothing of high quality care. Um, and Dr. Steve chooses to summarize this more broadly as uh, that you can never, adding an additional for-profit middleman cannot by definition save money and it always worsens access to and quality of care. Next slide. So having said that, we have a couple of national campaigns and national legislation uh, addressing this issue. Uh, one of them is the um, uh, Protect Medicare. Uh, you see the link down there below, protectmedicare.net, which is fighting against um, what is now called ACO reach. Uh, this was a, originally rolled out under Trump. Um, Actually, it's allowed under the ACA. This particular model was rolled out under Trump, uh, referred to as DCEs, uh, has been rebranded with what some of us consider to be merely cosmetic changes um, as ACO reach and essentially uh, amounts to, for example, Medicare Advantage, or some of us call it Medicare Disadvantage, is enrolling individuals into corporatized Medicare. Whereas ACO reach in effect is enrolling the entire uh, Medicare practice of a physician group into Medicare at the practice level. So um, please uh, sign up at Medicare, uh, protectmedicare.net uh, and take the actions there. Uh, next. So there is also a campaign to pass the Stop Wall Street Looting Act to address private equity broadly, including healthcare. Uh, this is uh, Senator Warren and Representative Spokon and Jayapal. Please note in all of these slides, the uh, bill numbers are from the 2021-2022 legislative um, uh, action. So they'll have new bill numbers, uh, quite likely, both the state and federal ones. Uh, but the Stop Wall Street uh, looting.org um, is sort of the campaign um, around this and other uh, things to improve um, Medicare and is also uh, put up by one of our co-sponsors, uh, AFR. Uh, so please go there and sign up uh, there. And again, the links should be being dropped in chat. They'll be sent out afterwards. Uh, next. So the uh, Healthcare Ownership Transparency Act would beef up the actual reporting, including for the nursing homes. Um, at the moment, it's a House bill from Representative Jayapal. Um, I don't have uh, any information at the moment about a Senate companion bill. Basically, it won't matter till the 2023 session anyway. Um, but um, why, as Richard said, while there is some reporting uh, by CMS, HHS, uh, currently on nursing homes, according to Public Citizen, um, and we'll have the uh, bibliographies for this. It's grossly inadequate. A lot of private equity is able to hide behind uh, unnamed black boxes and so forth. Um, so we need to, at the very least, while controlling private equity on our way to single payer, um, at least have honest transparency. Next, please. So here in New York State, uh, we think we are protected because uh, most types of healthcare facilities are not allowed to be for profit, quote unquote. Um, and that includes the large hospitals um, and um, uh, some other kinds of healthcare facilities, um, uh, so called diagnosis and treatment centers. 
Um, unfortunately, there's already, even under existing law, too many workarounds. Um, um, Richard Godfrey, longtime chairman of the health committee, has pointed out that the incursion of private equity in New York healthcare, despite our laws, uh, is a profound danger, uh, compounded by the growing trends of vertical and horizontal monopoly integration. I love his phrase, rectangular integration. If you've gone vertical, you've gone horizontal. Well, it's now a rectangle and it's a all monopoly box enclosed. Um, one of the ways they do this is they don't own the practice per se, they don't own the doctors per se, but they own everything else. They own the space that the doctor's practicing in, they own and or have funded uh, the uh, equipment and supplies and the billing uh, behind the practice. Um, so even though we ostensibly have this law against not-for-profits, um, I would point out that uh, well-known nationally, One Medical is opening up new sites all over New York City. Uh, One Medical has had venture capital. It has had private equity. It has had publicly traded. and It's being bought up by Amazon. Um, and that's right here in New York as it is everywhere else. And so we have the New York State legislature uh, legislation that we are promoting, of course, the New York Health Act. Uh, again, it will come back with new bill numbers in the new session, uh, and we will also have unknown at this time a new chair of the Health Committee uh, to take action for passing New York Health Act. Go to the uh, link that's uh, there in yellow. Um, three bills uh, that are uh, proposed that haven't uh, finished uh, being implemented. One is to help control that those chain for-profit medical clinics, uh, like the One Medicals and City MDs and so forth. Um, and uh, it passed the assembly, it's not passed in the Senate, so it'll need to come up again. The for-profit nursing homes, uh, there's legislation to prohibit any new for-profits and limiting the current ones to the current bed capacity. Again, passed the assembly, no action in the Senate. For-profit hospices, um, again, uh, prohibiting new ones and limiting the ones to the current capacity. Passed both houses and is in fact waiting for the governor to sign it. So if the governor were to actually sign this bill that already has passed both houses, uh, it would prevent any expansion of for-profit hospices in New York State. And again, to uh, take action for the New York Health Act, you can use that direct uh, link above. And for everything else in the assembly, you can look up your assembly member, who it is, and reach them via the switchboard and similarly for the Senate. Next slide. Thank you. So, we're time for uh, q and A. I I think we have about 10 minutes for Q&A, and then we will get three minutes at the very end on, on, uh, on uh, upcoming events. Uh, we have a, a number of questions. Uh, first one to Rose. Why do hospitals sell to these private equity firms? Who gets the money from the sale, and what do they do with it? It seems like there are villains involved. And if you <laughs> also want to answer the question about with physicians' practices, why does that happen? Uh, feel free. I'm sorry, what was the second question? Why does it happen? Well, so, so the first one is about who gets the money when hospitals sell? Where does it go? And the second one is why would physicians sell if this is, why would physicians be part of a private equity if? If uh, what if it's as bad as as we're told, right? So first of all, part of the uh, reason is that people just don't know what private equity is, and so for example, um, for if we take physicians first, as I said, there are many physicians who heard about this and said, well, you know, all the administrative work, I can basically outsource the billing, the, the accounts, the administrative work, and it won't, it'll help me uh, focus on my practice. And that's how private equity built it, build itself. And many, many physicians believe that to be true. And so they were not well informed uh, and that you know, even now, many people don't know about private equity and they say, oh, this is an opportunity to enhance my practice. Uh, there are also uh, actors who are in collusion with private equity, in which case the private equity firm goes to, say, uh, the senior uh, physicians 
I'll get to hospitals in a minute and senior physicians and says, you know, we'll set you up and you can have a share of the uh, returns. And so they, uh, they benefit. So that is a dynamic that also goes on with respect to hospitals. Um, a lot of hospitals have been worried um, uh, about, well, the same things go on. They've been worried about finances. And so they say, well, we'll turn it over to a, a private equity firm who will be more efficient. They sell, sell themselves as really being financially astute, more efficient, and will really run your hospital better than you can because we know. Uh, the other uh, way that private equity gets in is that, again, they, they make a deal. So, for example, HCA, which is all of you, I think most of you know, is the largest uh, for-profit corporation in the world. It, start, it, it has been a private equity owned and the originators, the Frisch, the Fish, Frisch, Frist family who owned uh, HCA started it, then went in cahoots with uh, Bain Capital and, and KKR to buy out of the hospital chain, take it private, and they've made billions under the private equity model. Then they sold it and they continue to operate HCA as a private equity model with a lot of debt, et cetera. So they're either people are unknowing on the one hand, or they are very knowing and they wanna collude and get in on the act and make a lot of money. And the money goes to individuals or to say the hospital board, whoever owns the it, hospital? It goes to, it, it goes to um, the uh, managers, the top men, the CEO, uh, like HCA, the Frist family get to invest and they get a big cut of the deal. It goes to the investors, the private equity firm, um, and but not to the hospital, no. Okay, Antonio. has their hand up. Okay, so let me ask another question. Uh, Richard, don't nonprofit nursing homes take better care of their residents? Is lumping them all together for profit, nonprofit appropriate? Uh, it, it is appropriate. I think that, um, you know, we've over the years, the not for profits, uh, they do have a bit more staff and they do tend to have better outcomes. But I think that we've seen a narrowing of that. Um, over the last several years. And a lot of times I see both personally and as well as in the data that the not-for-profits are run very similar, uh, similarly, excuse me, to the for-profits in terms of their staffing patterns, in terms of how they treat their residents, uh, shuffling residents around, discharging residents when they, no, when they no longer are coming in as a high paid or being, being reimbursed uh, as a high paid Medicare resident, but maybe going to Medicaid. So we see a lot of unfortunately the same patterns. And frankly, the not-for-profit lobby association, which is called Leading Age, is as rich as the for-profit lobbying association, which is the American Healthcare Association. And I would say at least as inscrutable in terms of uh, what they're willing to do and say to get more money and less accountability. So, so the problem is that running it like a business and having third party related contracts means you can make money and yet the balance sheet for the actual nursing home looks like it's pathetic. Correct. So I, for, like, for instance, I was speaking to a reporter a few months ago who called me about a specific nursing home and I looked up it's 1099, a poorly performing nursing home, not very much staffing, a low end staffing. Uh, and it is a not for profit. And the owner, not the owner, excuse me, didn't have an owner. The uh, administrator was making $1.6 million in salary in 2017, the last 1099 form that I found. So if you are, I mean, how, how many how, how many CNAs, nurse aides would that pay for? Uh, how many RN hours would that pay for for your residents? And um, it, it's a lot of money and there's just not that accountability there. Okay, thank you, Robert. There's a question well, about there's a question about does private equity investment affect specialties other than emergency room with these same kinds of differences? Is it good for anybody or have you looked at this? Uh, absolutely. Uh, take medicine back involves more specialties than emergency medicine. Uh, you see similar issues in anesthesia, you know, it's another hospital-based specialty. 
where you know they're being investigated, right? I said by the FTC. Um, there, you know, circumstances where an entire group of anesthesiology physicians were displaced by Envision, and they just staff with CRNAs with no physician oversight. You know, that's we think from a business standpoint not the best thing for the patient. Um, ophthalmology, somebody mentioned, they're a target. What we see in Durham is they hire a lot of non-physician providers who then just biopsy, scrape, generate money. You know, a doctor will look at this lesion and say, you know, I know what that is. You know, somebody who's less trained, I'm going to biopsy because we're going to make more money. I'm not going to get any negative feedback for that. So uh, not to say that dermatology uses is serious, I mean, with your cancer it is, but and we're talking about frontline healthcare here in emergency medicine where we're skipping. Um, it's, it doesn't make any empirical sense. I will add one thing to the first question is that a lot of physicians hear that other talk from private equities that we're big, we're strong, we can fight the insurers, which have been, you know, the weight around your neck for your entire practice. And they sell. And, you know, they say, hey, you know, I'm tired of fighting insurance companies, which make it very difficult for doctors. We're going to take all those worries away. We're going to pay you the same amount. You're a senior doctor. We're actually going to give you multiples of EBITDA. And you can essentially retire on that. And then the younger doctors have to pay back the purchase price plus the 20%, 30% profit level. And the patients get stuck with the higher bill. So now, you know, there is legislation against the surprise bills. Now there's even bigger squeeze going on in emergency medicine as these companies are having difficulty funding their debt. So it's, you know, there are forces out there like the insurance industry, which has helped lead to some of these actors giving up and selling out. So it's it's not, you know, it's, it is, some of it is the doctors themselves wanting to profit. You know, you have to admit that, but the insurance industry hasn't been our friend either. Thank you. So this question is for Steve, and if someone else wants to chip in too, uh, perhaps Rosemary, how does this private equity for profit and Wall Street stuff differ from private practice doctor being for profit? Sure. For example, like Marcus Welby is, you know, how does he differ from the chairman right. of Blackwell? So um, you'll notice we always use the term investor owned for profit. Um, and this is the distinction between, say, private equity or venture capital or even publicly traded companies, that it, they are all third party investor owned or investor controlled, which is the distinction between the doctor who hangs out his sh or her shingle or their shingle and um, owns the practice and is making money to support themselves and their family from it as a small business owner. They may take out loans from a bank, but that's very different than the bank owning and managing the practice. And so there is actually, I think, a very clear distinction that we can make between private practice physicians and the kinds of bad actors that we're talking about here. Um, and, uh, you know, the single payer movement, since it has been the single payer movements, always been talking about national comprehensive national health insurance everybody in, nobody out, but leaving in place, absolutely, uh, the mix of what we have now with private physicians, public hospitals, uh, and so forth, but just getting rid of the third party investor owned. Um, so uh, the other question that's come up in terms of, well, how do you know if PE is affecting me, um, is uh, it, basically, it's probably affecting you wherever you are, uh, even here in New York. Um, I'd like to take a moment to, you know, despite the um, root law that passed recently about uh, avoiding um, uh, surprise billing, and despite the fact that we have the not-for-profit hospitals, I recently had care that I was told ahead of time was under my uh, plan, covered, prior approval, um, at NYU Medical Center, um, just happened to be a not-for-profit because it's in New York, of course. Um, and lo and behold, in a classic move, I got a surprise bill from the anesthesiologist. So this is a classic one because you don't have control who your anesthesiologist is, um, just like you don't control radiology or labs very often. Um, what turned out to be the case was my insurance, in fact, had paid them $1,200. And then they tried to bill me an additional $600. 
um, even though New York State, even though a uh, new law on surprise billing. Turned out that the anesthesiology group wasn't NYU. It was one of these third-party corporate carve-outs uh, that was based in Westchester. Then the billing company, on um, their behalf, was based in Pennsylvania. And the anesthesiologist of record on the bill was in Texas. Um, so uh, if anybody knows a good lawyer, I really would like to sue the heck out of them. Um, they did finally get back to me and waive the $600 they were trying to do, um, and the reason they gave was an outright lie. So we'll stop there for a moment um, and see if there's any other questions. So, so, I, so I think we have time for one more question, if you all will bear with us, and I appreciate this. Rose, it seems like private equity is the worst kind of predatory capitalism. Um, should it be banned in healthcare? Should it be banned in does, does it have any redeeming social value? And how would you put a fence around it if it has such a thing? Uh, that's a big one. Um, so, I mean, I can answer that in, in moral terms, which is, yes, I would love to see a band or in more feasibility terms, which is that, um, you know, we've always had private pools of capital. We've had family owned businesses, for example, that, you know, they don't have to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission. They and they can be very, you know, good businesses or they can be not so good. Right. They can be kind of bottom feeders. Um, and so what really matters is the kind of regulation we have to constrain bad behavior. For example, if we simply, um, if we just uh, limited the amount of debt that private equity can put on companies, I mean, that in itself would cut out a swath of, of problems. If we held employer uh, private equity um, liable as employers, so right now they're considered passive investors, so if there's a lawsuit or something, it would fall on the, the company. Like if there's sex discrimination, it would fall on the company, not on the private equity firm behind it. If you simply made private equity the employer of record, then it, it immediately becomes much more transparent. If you, if, you, if you made it file with the SEC, the way the for-profit corporation. So there are a number of things you could do even within you know, the capitalist framework that would severely undercut the worst behavior. Um, and so you know, right now we're trying to get some basic regulation of private equity, be, particularly given the, the political environment. And you could do a lot to really cut the worst behavior out. I so, think. So, you're, so, so some of the things in the call to action would make a huge difference is what yeah. you're saying. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we're out of time. I want to thank the presenters for having very tight time frames and living inside them. We appreciate it. We would have loved to have another hour for questions, but that would have been a two and a half hour forum. Um, we will capture the question, the the chat. We will capture all the the links, and we will send them out to you with the PowerPoint, and the video will be available. But thank you, presenters. Thank and, you. Oh, one other thing, Judy, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, oh, I'll put my email in the chat. If people didn't get a chance to ask a question, I'm happy to have them email me and I'll respond that way because I know there's still hands up and I'd, I'd be happy to respond. Could you I'm also could you copy us when you do that so we can send out the Q&A to everybody? Okay, it's in the that chat now. Fabulous. Yeah, Thank we you. have all that, Judy. Judy, if somebody right. could bring up the master slides, we still have the um, final upcoming piece events. with the upcoming yes. events. Before folks leave. Yes. Next slide. So first of all, uh, there's a fight against uh, the city uh, retirees being forced into Medicare Advantage. Uh, the judge already ruled that it's against the law. So now, of course, they're trying to change the law. Um, so that's what this one's about, and it will be in, in our send outs Tuesday, October 25th. Next. 
So PNHP National is having our annual national meeting. It's in Boston this year. Our meetings are always top just before the American Public Health Association has their meeting. Uh, so we follow wherever they are the two days beforehand. Um, and we will be talking, among other things, about um, the privatization of everything uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, from uh, Donald Cohen, um, who's uh, that whole sort of privatization of public goods uh, that relates to exactly what we're talking about here. And we have Take Medicine Back is having their uh, annual summit, uh, the first day of which on Thursday, November 10th, is uh, virtual, so everybody can attend. Uh, that's the group that Dr. McNamara is with. And uh, next. And we want to thank all of our partners on this uh, forum, which includes, in addition to the organizations the speakers are with, uh, the American Economics Liberty Project, which is an antitrust, anti-monopoly group, Americans for Financial Reform, which is fighting the great the fight against private equity and the uh, for profitization, financialization of everything. CEPR, uh, great economic uh, and policy uh, think tank uh, for the people. Um, and the Private Equity Stakeholder Project, which, uh, as it says, is fighting the fight against uh, private equity on behalf of we, the stakeholders, um, as well as the other groups which were uh, represented in person today with the, with the speakers. So thank you, everybody, all of our partners on this fight together. Next. So and thank, thank you. you. I, we, we will try. It, there appears to be an appetite for a private equity part two. Uh, and that will, we are always looking for topics. So this may be a good one. There's clearly an appetite. And thank you so much to the speakers and to the audience and see you soon on the front lines. <laughs>